you can hear me. That's good then. Okay. So like any younger sibling, growing up with a big sister meant I was going to follow in her footsteps. So I started ballet with her as soon as I was able to. I did ballet for roughly 10 years until I was inspired by one of my friends at school to start gymnastics lessons, as well as my mum saying, you should go, you should go, you should go. Um, and after months of trying extremely hard at artistic gymnastics, which is the one with the flips and the, you know, the beam, the normal one, um, I realized I just was not any good. And my coach at the time, Sally Holmes, suggested that I should try rhythmic gymnastics. Being tall and fairly flexible meant that my body was far better suited for rhythmic gymnastics, the one with the ribbons and the hoops. Um, so at the very late age of 13, I, Sally introduced me to rhythmic gymnastics, and I've just not looked back since. In the rhythmic world, it's pretty much unheard of to start so late and still make the Olympic team. But it was clear that Sally had seen something in me. And whilst I was never naturally flexible, she continued to push me and encourage me to the point where within three years, I'd made the Commonwealth team for Team Gibraltar, and I was competing at the Delhi Commonwealth Games. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I managed to get through to the finals, and this really triggered something in me. It was like a first. I wanted to go to bigger, better, and higher-level competitions. So towards the end of 2010 came the opportunity to try out for the London 2012 Olympic um, team for rhythmic gymnastics for Team GV. And as I'm sure Sally will tell you, I, was very, I wasn't very confident. I was thinking, I'm not going to make the trials, let alone make the Olympics. But at the same time, I was determined to try my best, just attend them, and, do, and just do my best. And that's all anyone could have asked for. So after a strenuous journey involving cancelled flights because there was a snowstorm, I was on the last train to Swindon. By the time we got there, <laughs> the coach was like, oh, no, sorry, it's been cancelled. And we were like, what? They were like, oh, yeah, no one could get here. We were like, we've just flown in from Gibraltar. I'm pretty sure like, people could get here. So they decided to test me on my own. And um, it wasn't until a few weeks later that I'd found out I'd been successful. And that I was, if I wanted a place on the team, I was going to have to show full commitment and dedication to the team by moving my whole entire life to England. So at 17 years old, and with only two weeks to prepare for this, I was moving country at 17, leaving my family and my friends. I was changing my schools because I was in the mid, I was in mid AS level year, so I was in year 12, halfway through. Um, and it was with the intention of taking a whole entire year out of education to then compete at the Olympic Games, which still wasn't a guaranteed spot. We didn't have a spot. We still had to qualify. So I moved in with one of my friend, my teammate's family, and um, from there, you know, it was just training, training, training. The team originally consisted of 13 girls, th around 13 girls, but it was eventually whittled down to just seven, and that's when the true hard work began. By the summer of 2011, I'd moved into a house with three of my other teammates that weren't from Bath, because we were living in Bath at the time, um, and our days were consistently eat, train, sleep, repeat, and there was just no time for anything else, no social life, nothing. By this point, I'd been in the UK for nearly nine months, and I was feeling quite homesick. Um, and it, I was desperate for a trip home. As any of you know, I've, I need my glasses. I'm not very good at it. I can't see very well. And in the Commonwealth Games, I don't know how I did it, but I, I didn't use my contact lenses. And I basically struck a deal with my British coach that if I was to start wearing contact lenses, she would let me go home for my birthday, for my 18th birthday. So it was a, a no-brainer. I was like, OK. So it was literally train in the morning, leave the afternoon, birthday the next day, left the next day. I was back in England, back training again. But it was, I mean. It's a no-brainer. Um, but moving on, our first major hurdle was going to be the Olympic test event. We needed to get the qualifying score to make that, that event in the January. And this meant we had to go undergo a series of control competitions, all of which counted towards um, attending the Olympic test event and getting that score. We achieved this by mid-November, and um, we were all ecstatic about that. But being able to train for so long and attend this many competitions didn't come cheap, as I'm sure you can imagine. We were a completely self-funded team, and we had no support from British Gymnastics at the time. So we had to do a lot to raise the funds for us all to attend. I was supported personally by the Kasuma Trust Gibraltar, to which I'm very grateful. But as a team of seven girls, we had to find other ways to raise some funds. 
So we put on multiple displays, we searched high and low for sponsors, and we even did a Morrison's bag pack. <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> to ensure that we could continue on with our training. Bath Uni also graciously allowed us to train in and use our facilities for a discounted price. Um, and once you know, our story started getting around, we started gaining so, so much support from so many different people. But the pressure was on. We had three days to get the Olympic qualifying score in London in the O2 arena, and we only had, and we could all feel it. The test event in London came around, and the first day ran smoothly, and we were all very happy, and the ball routine ex exceeded the benchmark score that we had to get. And we were ready to go into our second day, heads held high, we were confident. I will be a bit nervous. But the second day didn't go as planned, as many of you might have heard. After one of the ribbons tied itself in a knot, which is quite a, a rare occasion, but it carries huge deductions, um, we, we missed the qualifying score by 0.02 of a mark. It's not even a whole mark. Um, and obviously we were disappointed, we were upset, we came off the floor and we thought, Christ, we've got tomorrow, we have to get the score, we're not going to the Olympic Games. But we weren't prepared for what our um, British gymnastics, he was like our media man, he came up and told us, he was like, no, sorry, girls, you've not made the Olympic, the, the Olympic team. We were like, what, what do you mean? We've got the third day. And he was like, no, no, that's it. And off he went to tell BBC and all these other newspapers that we hadn't got the qualifying score. Hence, these pictures making pretty much all the newspapers the next day. My head in my hands could not understand why they had refused to allow us to have the third day when in our contract it's clearly stated that we had the three days to get the Olympic score. So it was that evening that we went to the hotel lobby and our coach decided to buy us all some alcoholic drinks. We all had a vodka and lemonade. We hadn't drunk for, I'm not kidding, about a year and something. And you know, we were sitting down there and we were getting all fired up and we were getting angry. We were like, we can get the score and we only missed it by 0.02 today. Tomorrow we're gonna go out and get there. So we had this fire in our bellies and we were determined. And, um, we were not about to let anyone down, especially not ourselves. We had our families, we had everyone around us, and we were going to prove our national governing body wrong. <clears throat> so all fired up and raring to go, the third day was just a blur. We went out and we decided we're going to enjoy this performance. And we did the best performance we had done to date. And we proved our national governing body by surpassing the benchmark score by two whole marks. So the day before, we'd missed it by 0.02. The next day, we surpassed it by two marks. So we clearly showed that we could be up against the best in the world. But it was a completely different atmosphere to the ones we'd experienced before. And our coach had even given us a square of chocolate before we went on. And I think that's something we carried with us to the Olympic Games as well. Good luck, right? We need the chocolate. Um, but in the next couple of weeks, a court case took place. And with the support of our families, the Gibraltar government, uh, Hassan's lawyer, Julian Santos, and a renowned UK lawyer, Michael Bella. We saw our dreams come true when we won the fight against British gymnastics, which isn't a regular occurrence for any athlete in the national governing body. You don't take them to court and win, but we did. <laughs> Meanwhile, while this had been going on and our futures were just all up in the air, we were like, well, let's take a week off. Why not? Our coach was not happy about it, but we were like, this is going to be our cheat week. We're going to take the whole week off. We're going to eat whatever we want. We're going to drink whatever we want. We're just going to do whatever we want for a whole entire week. So the week finished. We had the best time. We come back into the gym to a really unhappy Sarah Moon, which was my British coach at the time. Oh, she was not happy. She marched us straight into the gym, straight to the weighing scales. Get on the weighing scales individually, each of us. And we were like, oh, go on the weighing scales. Like, oh, God. We put on a whole entire person between us. Seven girls put on around 60 kilograms in one week. We put on a whole person. She was not happy. So she made us remain in the gym and run until we'd worked off the amount that she'd worked out was the amount we'd put on each. In distance, we had to run. And we went like back in the gym until we'd done that. Came back in the gym. That week was the toughest week I've probably ever experienced in my life. Never again. Um, but it was all full steam ahead from there, and it was full hard work. We'd got the Olympic qualification, we'd got the place, we just needed to work for it now. And it's no surprise that we made good use of the psychologist and nutritionist that was provided to us by Bath University. Our diets were minimal, and we had to be extremely strict with ourselves. With the stereotypical image of a rhythmic gymnast being tall, lean, and extremely skinny, it's no wonder why my coach wanted us to look the part on the day. 
I was very lean, very muscly. I missed my abs. Um, <laughs> but yeah, our daily food intake wasn't much, and we weren't encouraged to drink a lot of water, which I think is very controversial, but we weren't encouraged to drink a lot of water during our 10-hour training days. We used to train 10 hours, 10 hours plus, and we, if I asked for some water, I'd be like, no, sorry, you need to carry on. So there was only little sips in between, and it was very tough. But training was getting tougher by the day, and with seven teenage girls, I think my coach was under a lot of stress, and training further intensified with the knowledge that only six girls were going to make the Olympic team. So we knew someone was going to be dropped out, but we didn't know who it was. But we had to work as a team to ensure that the team got to the Olympic Games, and, made, and we had to look good, but we knew that there was only six of us going, one person wasn't going. But most of all, our key to success was definitely our support system. From Sally Holmes, my original coach from Gibraltar, who encouraged me and pushed me to be the best gymnast I could be, told me I could do anything, took me to England to get onto the Olympic team. Sarah Holmes, Sarah Moon, who also encouraged us all and really took us to the Olympic Games. To my family and my friends, who without them, I could not have done half of the things I did. They never questioned me, they never doubted me, they just supported me. And even my friend Ginny Cooper, who works in Trafalgar Pharmacy, I don't know if you know her, but she actually, helped us stick on 3,000 plus Swarovski crystals onto 12 leotards within, I think, two weeks for the Olympic Games. Amazing. So grateful. And of course, to the government of Gibraltar and the whole community, you're all behind me, and I, could, I appreciate you guys so much. I was so grateful. Thank you for that support. <laughs> Thank you. But official selections eventually came round, and we found that my friend Annie had not made the cut. It was tough for us all to accept, but once we were in the village, it was a completely different atmosphere. We'd been stripped of our phones, and GBC wanted to speak to me, so I had to be escorted out of the village, because we weren't allowed out, we weren't allowed phones, and I managed to get my interview in. But once we were in the village, you know, rubbing shoulders with the people like Usain Bolt, I was having breakfast with Mo Farah, eating dinner with Chris Hoy, like, it was ridiculous, I'd, it was unreal. But the day of the competition, I don't remember feeling nervous. I remember waking up excited and raring to go, and showing everyone what we could do. Something that my face clearly didn't portray as I walked onto the floor and BBC caught me and stayed there for a good, like, 10 seconds. We performed to the best of our ability and we did ourselves proud. A wave of emotions came over me and I felt as though a big weight had been lifted off my shoulders once we finished. Sorry, I'm flicking through these really quick. My time's running out. We had done it and we were now Olympians. No matter what the scoreboard had said, we were the first team from Great Britain to ever compete in Olympic Games. And I was the first Olympian from Gibraltar to have made the team and become an Olympian. So we were extremely proud of ourselves. But exhaustion quickly took over and we made our way straight to the food court in the village. And I got myself a McDonald's. This is my first meal. I had to take a picture of it, obviously. You've got to document everything. Um, <laughs> but the next day was spent around London. We enjoyed ourselves. We went out. It was great. And then we had the closing ceremony. But it wasn't until the parade in London on the 10th of September, National Day, when we drove past the Gibraltar house and I had my flag in hand, that I really felt that wave of emotion and pride to be Gibraltarian. And since then, you know, I've had so many opportunities. I've met the Queen. I've met Carol Smiley, Annabelle Croft, I've been lucky enough to work with them. I've been on shows like Russell Howard's Good News, James Corden and League of Their Own. I've worked with Torval and Dean on ITV's Dancing on Ice. I've been scouted by multiple talent agencies since I had a hip operation in 2014, so I can't compete anymore, but I can still perform. But what's my message to you? I'm really running out of time here. The thing's gonna go. But what's my message to you? I wanted this talk to really emphasize that no matter where you are in life or how old you are, if you have a passion for something, anything, that truly drives you and motivates you, that gets you out of bed in the morning, just go for it. Don't lose sight of your end goal. Life will want to throw all kinds of hurdles and to trip you up, but it's important that you remain focused, accept your losses, embrace your drawbacks, and come back harder the next time. If competitions, and the test event especially, taught me anything, it is that, to come back harder the next time. Once you have a plan, it's easy. Just work it back and you will, that's where the hard work comes in, you will achieve your end goal. I'm a strong believer that everything happens for a reason, but I also believe that every choice we make along the way, however small, creates our own fate.